everybody and welcome to the second of our International Health Workforce Collaborative Roundtables. Um, today's uh, session will be hosted by the UK. My name is Ivy Bergeau. I'm with the Canadian Health Workforce Network and proud to be a member of the IHWC. And uh, I'm coming to you from the city of Ottawa, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe First Nations people to whom I pay respect. Uh, so I am now going to pass over to Chris, who will introduce the session, our colleague from uh, the UK. Uh, thank you very much, Ivy. Um, as I've said to previous people on this call, I'm in a slightly um, internet challenged environment, so I'm not going to do any talking. I'm just going to hand straight over to my colleague, Sharon Sweeney from Manchester, who will talk to you now. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, I'm great to be with everyone this morning. Um, I want to talk about two principal um, studies that we've been doing in Manchester. And we can just go to the first slide. They are the, an investigation of the scale, scope and impact of skill mix change in primary care, and also the 11th National General Practitioner Work Life Survey. I think it's useful to set the pre-COVID context. The, Primary care workforce in the UK has been changing and changing quite a lot in recent years. Traditionally, we had as, as many places, general practitioners, practice nurses, and some reception admin and management staff. But increasingly, we've seen an influx of different other health professionals, health associated professionals. In terms of numbers, looking at it in detail, uh, and particularly looking at it as FTE per thousand patients, you can see that in the period prior to the pandemic, we could see a clear decrease in the availability of general practitioners within the workforce um, and, and a, an influx of some of the other people that we mentioned just now. There are in fact two employment models now. One is those that are employed directly by practices in the usual traditional sort of manner, uh, but also there is now additional funding that's bringing increasing numbers of these folks in, into the workforce. With a different workforce, you've got to distribute the work differently, and the mantra of getting the right patient to the right appointment at the right time has become particularly prominent. To do that, you have to have various processes in place, and, and we've looked at these in, in a lot of detail, setting them out as, first of all, you have to have good problem categorization, a really good understanding of what the patient's problems are. You also need to know what your practitioner's competencies are, and, and these change from time to time and, and therefore need to be looked at periodically for review. You also need to have appointments available that are acceptable for the patient, suitable for the problem. And hopefully that will lead to a, a successful consultation. But this can clearly go very far wrong at, at various stages if the problem isn't understood, if the competencies are, are a bit misunderstood also, and also if you don't have enough appointments. So, the processes that are necessary for the redistribution of work um, can be looked at in, in these terms of, of the problem and the practitioner categorization, the matching that goes on, but then also you need some inherent flexibility within your system uh, to make adjustments to resolve any miscategorization, mismatching, the many things that can go wrong with a large unfiltered uh, caseload. And we, we've written these up, I, I've just put details of, of the paper that's recently been published, looking at that in some detail. We also looked at an Im, the impacts on outcomes. The, these are very nuanced and, and detailed, and I think it's probably not possible even to summarize them uh, in, in this brief update. Um, but we have a paper that I've also listed there uh, that you can refer to. So what happened in 2020? Clearly, there was a move towards to do total triage and remote consultations. There was an enhanced role for receptionists in allocating appointments, whether those were going to be face to face or by telephone or, or possibly some other means. There was a much greater emphasis on matching patients' problems with practitioners' skills in the way that we've talked about. Uh, some practices have been using fairly rudimentary means before, but they had to scale that up. Some practices used advanced practitioners uh, to help with the triage for frail elderly and care home residents for whom was a visit necessary because that clearly came with a lot of 
use of resources in terms of time and, and also PPE that was in short supply in the early stages. Some adopted a doctor first triage model, um, probably in an effort to try to get the categorization really nailed down properly so that the, the, the right appointment was offered. Clinical staff clearly had to acquire additional IT skills using direct messaging with patients, using images to support the diagnostic work and sometimes video consultations. They reported variable levels of IT skills amongst patient groups, and, and some were quite concerned that they were actually increasing inequalities due to um, people unable to access the internet, not having the technical skills or abilities to do so. And there was also a varied level of acceptance by different patients for different types of problems. Some felt that mental health issues, which were mostly dealt with verbally, could, could actually work quite well remotely. Some felt that it was quite useful to be able to reassure parents of children who were only mildly ill um, using remote means. The paper I've listed at the bottom looked in a lot of detail at just how uh, these changes were being implemented. The impact on the workforce and working patterns was reported in, in various different ways. Um, uh, the, the practices that we, we returned to, to, to ask about this thought that they had been, that the whole effort of working together during a health crisis made them feel so much more part of a team. They were involved in shared decision-making about things like, is a visit necessary? Is an appointment necessary? How should we manage this case in this situation? And they were also communicating more with neighboring practices for, for things like coordinating vaccination programs, establishing hot hubs for COVID positive cases. They, they reported a new practice of having handover conversations amongst themselves. Um, the rapidly changing guidelines meant that they had to have regular updates about what was going to happen. And they also had to really monitor who was available for work on a day-to-day -day basis. There was a raised awareness that practitioners could in fact be deployed differently to what had been happening in the past, uh, leading potentially to a reconfiguration of the workforce, able to supply different patterns of access for different patients at different times. For example, fewer visits were being done uh, to patients at home, so, so they didn't quite need that so much, um, but also they had an increasing number of patients with mental health problems who needed support. Some adopted the use of artificial intelligence to collect information from patients to support the processes of categorization and matching. So the focus became more on clinical need as described, rather than simply responding to the patient's request. There was also increased opportunity for flexible working. So some staff were selected to be on site and therefore available for face-to-face -face consultation if needed, while others were working remotely. But there were many concerns about how this was actually playing out for patients, about being remote, about being isolated, about missing things. And, and, and so these had knock on effects on how they felt about work. And following on from this, the GP Work Life Survey explored this in more detail. And I shall now hand over to John. Thanks, Sharon. Um, yeah, so in, in Manchester, we run the GP Work Life Survey which is a survey of GP working lives. We ask questions where we, we're, we're interested in exploring the uh, hours of work that GPs uh, perform, how many sessions they work, what their career intentions are, whether they plan to leave the workforce, increase their hours, what their job satisfactions are. And we also track policy changes and how GPs working lives respond to those. And clearly um, COVID-19 as well. We, our last survey was in 2020 and 2021. We've, so far, we've had 11 waves of data across 24 years. Uh, each year, we have a cross-sectional element and a longitudinal element. So we're able to track GPs over time, see how their working lives are changing and evolving in relation to policy changes as, uh, and as they age, how their job satisfaction changes. Uh, we have had a slight change in methodology. Previous waves, we were randomly sampling GPs and sending them out paper questionnaires addressed to them at their practice, as well as longitudinal uh, sample. More recently, we've moved to an online model where we're emailing uh, survey invitations to their practices by the clinical research networks, which we have in England. Next slide, please, Sharon. Um, so the, the survey is uh, mainly sort of Likert scale 
uh, type questions. So we asked them in uh, about their job satisfaction. So we asked them a range of questions about uh, how satisfied they are with their job, how satisfied they are with, with the work. Here's just a selection of, of some of them. You can see we asked them on a, a one to seven scale going from extremely dissatisfied to extremely satisfied. Uh, and I'm just gonna present a few uh, quick um, results. So we can see that overall job satisfaction, which is the, the last question on that list that I just showed you, um, was at a high point in around 2010. And after various uh, sort of changes in policy and, uh, and changes in the workforce, we can see that that job satisfaction was, was, was decreased, decreasing significantly up until around 2015, which was at uh, GP job satisfaction was at its lowest point. And in the past few years, we started to see a, 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 an increase again in GP job satisfaction. Uh, until the last wave of the survey, which clearly um, was impacted by COVID-19. So we've seen that some of those more recent gains have been eroded by um, the, the pandemic and the stresses that that's brought to the workforce. Next slide, please. We also track intentions to leave. So these are GPs who are under the age of 50, and we can track their um, intentions to leave the workforce. So here we've got the percent of under 50 uh, GPs who are, who report a considerable or a high intention of leaving the workforce within five years. As you can see, that's been increasing since 2010. And in the previous wave of the survey, we actually started to see a decrease in, in the number of uh, GPs who are intending to leave the workforce. And again, during the pandemic year, our respondents, we've had a, a big increase in the proportion who are saying that they are actively considering leaving the workforce within five years. We track the, the weekly hours of work um, that, that GPs state that they perform. And as you can see, this has been pretty static um, over the, since 20, 2008, since we've been recording this, up until around 2017. And we can start to see that, that uh, more part-time work is being performed by GPs. So we can see that weekly hours of work is, is, has been declining in the past few years, as more and more GPs opt for, for part-time work and doing slightly less number of sessions. Um, as well as job satisfaction, we asked them about elements of their job that may um, lead to stress. So we have a list of uh, GP job stressors. So here are just two of them. Um, this is captured on a one to five Likert scale with five being a high pressure and one being low pressure. You can see that um, we've got adverse publicity by the media that increased in 2015 and we're starting to decline. And then during the pandemic year, there was lots of uh, stories in the press about um, patients being able to get uh, appointments at their GP practice. And then we've started to see that that pressure has started to increase. Whereas changes to meet requirements from external bodies, we can see that that's, uh, that's been decreasing since 2015, reported stress from that. Um, even in the pandemic year, we've, start, we've, we've, we've tracked that decline as well. And as well, satisfaction with the amount of variety in the job. We can see that it's been declining, started to increase. And then during the pandemic, pandemic year, that has declined again. So it's a bit of an outlier going on in uh, 2019, but we can see that that's, that's declining. So just to summarize, that we've got a, a GP workforce crisis in England. We're starting to see more and more uh, staff from other workforce groups in, in GP practice. We run a GP work life survey, which allows us to track GP job satisfaction and their intentions to leave the workforce. We've seen low satisfaction from GPs in, their, in terms of their job satisfaction since 2012. However, we've seen some recent improvements, but these have largely been eroded by the additional stresses that have been brought about in the pandemic year. So, thank you. We've uh, released a full, a full uh, report on our findings from the GP work life survey, and that's available on the CrewCom website. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, I can see that there is a question has just appeared. So I'll just say we don't have any questions, but we have just had a question come in. Um, does intention to leave translate into attrition? Do younger GPs leave the workforce completely or leave their current practice or change their practices? Are you able to respond to that? Uh, yeah, so there has been a bit of work done, which has sort of followed followed that up that question, looking to see if is there a correlation between people who have have stated 
in our survey that they intend to lead the workforce and do they actually follow up on upon that threat is this a signal within the survey that they're unhappy and this is highly correlated with job satisfaction or is it actually a signal that they are actually intending to leave the workforce um there was uh, it, the, the the work is a little bit old now so it, it, it is something that we plan to look at in the future but there was a correlation between people actually following up on that threat uh, i like to use the word threat threat the threat vector Okay, thank you very much for that. Okay, with no further ado then, because uh, I'm not seeing any other questions, I want to say thank you, John and Sharon, that was excellent. Um, and I'll now hand over to um, Morag McPherson and Ben Tate, who work um, with me at NHS Education for Scotland, um, just to say that we are, although our title would seem to suggest that we are about development and training, uh, we're actually also, we're more about workforce in its wider context, it's very much the direction of travel for our organisation. So um, I'll hand over to Morag and to Ben. There we go. Sorry about that. This is um, so let's start this. Yeah, so thank you, Chris, for, uh, for that introduction. Yeah, so myself and my colleague Morag work in the data group within um, NES and we're going to just doing a quick talk today on firstly I'm going to start off with a piece of work that we've just started really but are looking to expand on and work more on on the retention of pre-registration nurses and midwives um, and into the workforce in NHS Scotland and then my colleague Moreg will be looking at the um, general medical practitioner workforce. So um, just a bit of background, um, all students in nursing and midwifery courses in Scotland are indexed um, within, uh, and that data is held by, by NES. So this has been, um, students have been indexed for um, about 30 years, 30 or 40 years in Scotland, but NES took over that um, function from the previous board and we say we've got sort of really good data going back probably about 20 years. Um, so what we have started looking at is the flow of these work of these students wh who all receive a bursary, currently receive a bursary from the Scottish government. So they, um, where there's a lot of interest from then in the, in the, are they getting the value from money? Do the, um, where do these students go to university and where do they end up in, employment so we use the national insurance number which is included in the index um, and then we find them in our payroll data on who is being paid in Scotland and where that is happening so this will allow um, NHS boards to be to better identify where are their students coming from though our universities to identify where do their students go after graduating um, this data is, we we're able to break this down by several different fact um, variables, including with the field of nursing and midwifery, whether they're adult mental health, whether they're doing um, a 36 month course, whether they've gone, the students have gone into second year entry. And then we can look at sort of year they've started, year they've, their course, when they've started employment, where they have, and also, um, the home country of students prior to matriculation. Um, so whether these are when we are looking at those students who don't end up in, who we never see again in the employment data, have are these students from other parts of the UK who've come to university in Scotland and then um, gone back south to England. So unfortunately, because of this data, I haven't been able to show the actual actual data here but this is sort of how we've begun presenting it with the flows of data from a university to the different boards one of the areas we've particularly been looking at is um flow of data into rural boards who don't have local nursing local universities for their um for nursing so where where do they get them from um and how how better how they can better 
get more students essentially we can then also look at have they remained in the nhs board that they started in do they leave nhs scotland or do they move to a different board from the first one they've started in particularly for these rural boards as i mentioned before so as i said this work is just getting going but we've got some really good interest um, from universities also plans to expand this out to doing several allied health professions primarily paramedics which also receive a bursary so again where do these where are these people based um, and used to identify where nhs boards as i mentioned before essentially in um, rural areas particularly where they struggle to attract and retain students um, and we're also able to quantify this number of students who complete a course in scotland but never appear in our workforce which the Scottish Government particularly interested because it, it costs £60,000 roughly to train a nurse. So if they're spending this money fully to train this, these nurses and they never appear, where do they go? Unfortunately, we can't, with our current data flows, we find it quite difficult to tell if they don't start employment, where do they actually go? We don't, um, do they go into um, work in care homes or, or private? Are there private and non-NHS sources? Do they go south? Um, particularly, all, another development that we're hoping to do is to find, for, uh, going back to the rural boards, do um, if we're wanting to increase the number of, of nurses who go first go to one of these rural boards, can we increase the flow from these rural boards into a university so they'll then return we, they're more likely to return to that board to work than someone who, for example, has um, grown up in a city, less likely to move to rural to a rural place. Um, and yeah, I'm now going to pass to my colleague Morag, who is going to talk about um, the general Med medical practitioner workforce. Cheers, Ben. Um, yep, so I'm going to give you a bit of a, a quick tour through some of the GP workforce analysis that we've been doing um, just over the last year or so, but we've also got, still got some outstanding uh, projects that we're looking at. So the demand on our primary care has been steadily increasing due to a combination of ageing population and rising levels of multi-morbidity. This was recognised by the Scottish Government, um, who set a policy in 2018 to increase the workforce by at least 800 headcount over the next decade. This support policy and decision makers in the government and also in NHS boards by interrogating our workforce and training data to provide analysis on different components of the workforce. So I'll touch on some of these types of analysis shortly. So our main source for the GP data is the National Primary Care Clinician Database, or the MPCCD, and that's, public, that's managed by Public Health Scotland. Um, this data is individual level data, and it records all general practitioners working in Scotland. Um, it doesn't include locums though, and it has a number of variables, such as the practice, designation, age, and date of birth. Um, so over the last decade, the GP workforce has increased by about 3%, so it's just sitting at over 4,500 headcount. Um, but the demographics of that workforce has changed quite significantly. So 10 years ago, the percentage of the workforce who were female was 51%, whereas it's now 61%. And the number aged over 50 um, has increased by 10%, but proportionally, um, this age group is actually slightly less, or it makes up slightly less of the workforce. Um, now, there's also significant variation across Scotland. So the median age in Western Isles is 51 compared with Midlothian, which is 42. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. Um, so one of the ways we can understand the dynamics underlying the workforce is to decompose the flows. Um, we typically look at four flows. So this chart shows uh, the outflow, which is that light blue line at the top. Um, the dark navy line is the inflow from trainees. So these are people that complete their training and then join the trained workforce within Scotland. And the yellow line is people who have left the workforce and then they return at some point after and the pink line there shows the number of people that start in the workforce um, from outside Scotland. 
So uh, looking at this chart, we can largely see that one of the key uh, dynamics under underpinning the change in the workforce numbers has been the increase in the number of trainees completing their training and joining the workforce. Um, next slide, please. So we can use the decomposition to estimate the probability of someone leaving and joining the workforce dependent on both their age and their sex, which are key uh, variables in, in these rates. Um, but one of the, the critical calculations of this is the time to complete their training. So um, for this, we actually use a different data source, which is owned by Ness and managed by Ness. It captures uh, more detailed information about trainees and also their specialty programmes. We apply a discrete uh, time to event or survival analysis to these data and that can estimate the probability that someone will complete their specialty training X years after starting. So once we've estimated these flow rates, um, we can then use a forecast model to estimate what the workforce would look like over the next five years or so. Uh, we present this in an interactive dashboard for our end users and we also allow uh, these users to interact with some of these key parameters um, which affect the forecast, such as how many people uh, will enter the workforce from outside Scotland. Um, however, the forecast model assumes that people who complete their training start within the workforce right away. This is a pretty bold assumption. Um, we know that people often take, they might take a career break or they might locum for a time before taking up a permanent post. By linking our training and our workforce data, we can measure this retention rate. And that means that we can also improve our forecasting. Um, as shown earlier, there was significant variation in the GP workforce demographics across Scotland. To attract more trainees in rural and remote areas, a one-off taxable payment scheme was announced by the Scottish Government to trainees working in rural areas. We can apply a difference and difference method to these data and understand um, how the scheme has affected trainee and workforce retention rates uh, across Scotland. And finally, we'd like to investigate how the impact of areas of deprivation um, impact the train and the training workforce um, across Scotland. So I think that's probably all I have time for, but um, if you've got any questions, please just get in touch. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, both Ben and Morag. Um, I'm, Ivy, I can see there's some questions in the chat. Would you like me to address those to Ben? I think that's what we'll do. Um, so, uh, I think the first the first question, but Ben actually was, do you separate these out the um, midwife midwifery workforce from the from the nurses? Yes, no, we do, and yeah, um, they are as you say, they are quite distinct. Um, we do uh, we do find that there is a greater um, there, there's a, a lower retention rate in. Um, in nurses compared to midwives um, and uh, that goes right the way through the, their course um, there's uh, midwives are more likely to complete their course than nurses and are more likely to enter the workforce than nurses so there's all the way through okay don't go anywhere Ben because you're a popular man um, so the next question for Spino is um, do you still have local midwives who do antenatal deliveries home birth and postnatal care across district uh, yes, there is, um, and this is not something I'm a, a complete expert in, but we do have, uh, there's a move towards um, having one midwife for your care right the way through from booking appointment through to um, where, giving birth. So you've got, this, you should, um, up, and that's how we're transitioning to that throughout Scotland. So you'll have the same midwife all the way through, um, so, but you can you can choose, it could be up to you to choose whether you have home birth or a hospital birth. Okay, excellent. Um, there's a sub subsidiary, I can say that word, question. Uh, what does the data tell you about nurses you have tracked so far? Um, what does it tell us? So it, uh, it, it's a bit of a mixed message. Um, and what is, they um, rural boards do struggle to retain to retain nurses and midwives they um especially they're sort of there's only three there's only three centers from uh, midwifery for example 
in Scotland, um, in one in Aberdeen, one in Aber which is up in the north, one in the west, and one in the east, down in the south. And um, the north, you tend to struggle to retain. If you go to the Aberdeen one, you're quite likely to stay there for university and then immediately come back down to the sort of the big cities down in the south because, yeah, you're young and you don't sort of cold and dark up north. Don't say any more. Don't say any more about what young people do. That's not for now. Um, OK, um, yeah, and I think you've sort of touched on that because another subsidiary question is, is there an expectation nurses may leave the area for a while, some years, and then return to that area in Scotland? I think you just answered that question. Yeah. Um, so um, question for more eggs, uh, grass, what happened? What has been happening to full time equivalent for GPs across different age groups? It's a, it's a good question and one we can't really fully answer. So the um, main workforce data only has a headcount value. Um, there is a GP survey, which I think is carried out every second year. Um, and that that's all aggregated data, um, which uh, gives us a, a full time equivalent estimate. Um, but I can't, I can't recall, I'm afraid I can't recall the results of that off the top of my head. I'll find it and post it in the, the chat. Um, I'll do that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the lastly from me, um, the question that Ivy's posted about the issue of harassment um, for both presentations, do you ask questions about violence? Um, Morag, I'll bounce to you and then on to Sharon. Or John. We have, we have a question about relationships with colleagues. Um, and I think we also have a, a question that deals with what might be termed patients who are difficult to deal with. So I, I, I guess you would hope that something would come up in those categories if, if that was a, a problem. But I, as far as I can recall, John will correct me, um, there's nothing specifically using that terminology. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, so I'm not seeing any more questions, so I'm going to quickly move us on to Andy. Are you there? I hope so. So do I. Excellent. Look at that. Seamless. Andy, I'll give you the floor. I shall click some buttons to see what happens. Um, do, do, do. Um, uh, on the um, harassment question, there's a survey run by the General Medical Council and we, of all trainees, and we do ask... Um, uh, are you um, belittled, embarrassed by your um, uh, in your training? Uh, how many screens can you put up at one time? Um, uh, okay, can you see my screen? The screen I want you to see, rather than the other thing. So the headline. Okay. Um, so go about the GMC. Click and click. Get everything wrong. Yes, there is a survey, and we do ask trainees uh, cases of incidents of bullying and intimidation. Um, and we also ask from whom? So is it from your also your other trainees or is it from your doctors who are supervising? Is it from your patients? And there's a whole cross section. Um, doctors who are training in obstetrics and gynecology get bullied a lot in relative terms by midwives. Um, it's those sort of different, uh, so it, it's, it's interesting. But anyway, anyway, go back to my patter. Um, I'm just gonna briefly go over the changes in the UK workforce as a result of COVID. Um, uh, do a bit of preamble, get my excuses in early. I am not a clinician, I'm a data guy. I spend my life poring over data. So if you've got some complicated questions about how procedures work, I am not the person to ask. I pore over data and then I analyze the computer models. And I'm also a Myers-Briggs ESTJ, which might come over in the next couple of minutes, stuff like that. Um, and yes, that's me on my bike looking terrible. Nothing changes. Um, uh, another health warning. Um, everyone sort of seems to view the NHS. Well, the NHS is not a single organisation. It's it's a brand, but lots of hospitals have a light blue sign that says NHS outside, and they have their own ways of working. It gets even more complicated in the fact that within the UK, each country has its way of doing things. So England does one thing, has a different way of, of running the service, and Wales a different thing, and Scotland and Northern Ireland a different thing. On top of that was COVID, and each of the four countries had different ways of doing handling COVID. We had one point um, where in England, you could go and watch a football match, I'll translate a soccer match, 
but you couldn't go to Wales. The games were run, but crowds were not allowed. And there was an anomaly where there's a, a football pitch. The entrance was in England. The pitch was in Wales. And there was a whole lot of legal discussion about could you actually go and watch the game there? So there's a whole lot of anomalies and trying to work out how did the UK handle COVID? Because there's lots of ways and different means of, of handling and priorities. The other complication is that, I'm sorry, this is just for England data, it affected, um, COVID affected different areas within England and across the, and the UK to different levels. So right at the bottom down here, is this is the death rate um, for people testing positive for COVID in the last 28 days before they died. The Southwest, which is the peninsula bit pointing out towards the Atlantic, um, surrounded north and south by water, had a very low death rate um, per population was compared with the, uh, the Northwest, which is the Manchester and Liverpool's, had a higher death rate. There's also different curves. So London initially had a higher impact and other people then caught up over other regions. That consequently might have fed back to how people worked. London got hit, learned from what had to do, different ways of working, and then that sort of rippled out across, try this, learn from our mistakes or experiences. So it's very difficult to say, the UK did it this way, it doesn't exist. However, we do have regulators, we might have multiple hospitals doing different things in four different countries, we do have typically regulators who cover the whole of the UK. So you can be registered as a doctor with the General Medical Council and you can work anywhere in the UK, you don't have to be registered in England and then not be able to work in Wales, it all, all covers. So I'm just going to rattle through the things that um, the key things that each of the major uh, regulatory bodies have done. So the Nursing and Midwifery Council, with a clue in their name, they um, they opened a temporary register. Um, uh, I'm sure I had a number somewhere, and it looked uh, so anyone who'd left the profession within five years. It wasn't just every anyone. You had to make sure that you know you weren't struck off, or we don't want to see you again. Oh, we'll have you back for COVID. There was rules and regulations. You could only work within uh, for the purposes of COVID-19. Um, they had to work within the same scope of practice. About 16,000 came back in the temporary register for that, and a total nursing and midwifery workforce for the whole of the UK is 745,000. So it's not a big number, but better than zero. Interesting, Nursing and Midwife Council have surveyed um, the ones who were on the temporary register and asked the question, are you going to stay now? Uh, barely, uh, about 50% said highly unlikely they decided to come back to support COVID and they've maybe done their time. I had already retired and that's it, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. So that's the register. Uh, also the NMC um, did work so that uh, nurse, uh, nurses in training could take up paid placements. You couldn't do that, it had to be clinical placement, take up paid placements and that would be part of their training. And also we had to work out rules that first year students in nursing, typically a three year course, they couldn't do the clinical placements. Hospitals didn't want more students coming in hospital. In hospitals, less people coming in maintain uh, decrease the risk. So these guys were not getting the clinical placements. But then, how could we say they could progress? So the rules were flexed, allowing them to progress, although they hadn't achieved their placements. Having said that, as of September, returning to the new normal, uh, those standards have been removed. So we're, we're reverting through. I then go to uh, General Medical Council. They created a temporary register. About 30,000 um, doctors were offered to come back on the register. 28,000 took up the offer. Uh, 12,000 um, were registered with the GMC, but weren't currently practicing, so they didn't hold a license. And 16,000 were still in, uh, weren't registered, uh, had previously been in that like, like three or six years, and they came back. Unfortunately, one of the, I have to say, failings of the NHS, whatever, is, is it's very difficult to have, find a data set that actually says, what did they do? Not just the temporary register, but anyone in the NHS. Um, we pay them, and we have a position, and they have a post, a salary, but actually what they do is very difficult to actually see. So we have lots of anecdotal evidence that um, trauma and orthopedic surgeons spent most of COVID working in ICU proning people because they weren't that they were available to do it. So it would be nice to have that, but we don't have that information unless other people say otherwise. Other things we tried or did 
uh, was that final year medical students across the UK who completed their studies in April could start early. Normally they come through in August, but they started early. So down here is a little graph that shows the typical number of new UK registrants per year. And we had a big increase there of what we called FIY1s um, who could come in and help the service. So these are entry level, wet behind the ears, former medical students starting earlier to support the service. Unfortunately, that's only a one time hit because those are now in the service for the following year. So then we have a dip in the numbers of 2021 of new registrants because they've gone through. We couldn't repeat the procedure if we needed to because the ones in the earlier years had not achieved their clinical placements possible to progress the level. So they weren't in the same state as the final year, even after a year through. But we introduced the numbers. The biggest problem for me, I often warble about uh, medical, is derogation. Um, and this is, as I said, biggest problem, as in it's going to have a lot of knock-on effects progressing all the way through. In the UK, there are 65 medical specialties, 31 subspecialties, a whole chunk of them are just in paediatrics, but knocking on 100 specialties and subspecialties. Every single one of them has a published curriculum. If you want to click on the link at the bottom of the down there, you can find them. And it's got pediatric cardiology and here's a PDF and all that. that. And each one has a training pathway. You need to progress through here. You need to get these competencies before you go to the next level. But because of COVID, things like exams didn't happen. A, we were not going to take doctors out of hospitals to go and take their exams. B, we didn't have the capacity to take have the exam, so all the exams were stopped. That stopped doctors potentially in progressing through their training. So what we did is derogated and said, you don't have to pass these exams. Your local deanery, which is the organization that's responsible for their training, can say, yeah, you're good enough, you're safe enough, you can progress. We imagine you would have passed that exam and you can progress through. This generates problems potentially in the fact that at some point they will have to take the exams, then you have capacity problems. And at some point you might have people who progress further at the training program who fail their exam. What do we do with them now? Do we throw them off the training? Do we hold them in training longer? And this is gonna be continued for many years after we're into the new normal and still, why are we doing this? Oh, because of COVID, remember that? Oh, haven't we cl cleared that up? No, that's all gonna still continue. Um, uh, health professions council. Um, these this is the health professions who are PTs, physiotherapists, OTs, uh, paramedics, radiographers, diagnostic therapeutic. So that all the other healthcare professionals um, working typically in hospitals. They again opened a register, 21,000. Um, took it up. Then there was a temporary register like, like the FYI ones for the medical schools. Um, yet final year students could come through. About 15 of the 15 prof professions, there's 28,000. So you're looking at 25,000 new additional resource. Again, I don't really know. I can't find a data source of what they've done. So that's what the whistle stop tour of the um, uh, health professions and the other, other health regulators will have done similar things in new board. The other niggly nally concern I've got that again, remember COVID? Oh, haven't we fixed that? Is in the UK, you have to take A levels in England and Wales and things called hires, which is basically an exam that kids at roughly about the age of 18 have to take in maths, physics, and chemistry, or English literature, or whatever, you get an exam, uh, um, and subject to getting the right grades, you have a legal right to get the university that you've applied to. So you say, I want to go to Edinburgh. You go and look at Edinburgh and think, this is lovely. I want to live here, stay there, and work for the rest of my life. Nez will be really happy if you did. Um, so you then go to Edinburgh Medical School, and you say, say, right, if you get three straight A's, you can come to Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Edinburgh Medical School. But we didn't have the exams. Instead, it was teacher assessed grades. So your teacher said, I think you're going to get straight A's. Um, actually, more people got straight A's than we'd normally have. It's called grade inflation. So teachers were slightly more optimistic um, than what they actually, uh, the historical trend. Consequently, more people got into medical school, have got into nursing because they had more, more A-levels than expected, than the university expected. 
they've been taken in. Now it has knock-on effects. We've got to find more clinical placements for these students, uh, which might be a struggle in different areas and different geographies. So if you're in a, in a city area, you can probably flex in more places, but if in rural, you're maxed out. There's also the potential issue that the increase in entry numbers won't necessarily generate an increase in number of graduates. We don't know. These could be a whole lot of people who really shouldn't have got to university. Sounds terrible, but they should be filtered out after their A-levels, but they've got in. But we spend time and energy training them and they're struggling to go through and eventually they drop out. Or it could be conversely, actually, by having removed the A-levels, we've got a wider cohort of people coming in to nursing and medical schools and physiotherapies. We don't know. It's going to be a lovely natural experiment at some point in the future to be able to say, wasn't COVID a good thing for the, this particular narrow envelope which showed that we don't need A-levels or actually A-levels are really good at filtering and not handing on universities and employers in the future. Um, that was my whistle stop tour. Um, any questions, if there's a recording, feel free to drop me an email. I will probably not be able to answer those questions, but I hopefully will know who can answer them. Chris, back to you. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, Andy. Excellent. Um, I, just, I can see that the, the, there is a question, but it comes from Ivy. So I think in terms of handing back, um, I'll just say thank you to Sharon, John, Morag, and Ben, um, and you, Andy. Thank you very much, it was excellent. Um, Ivy, I'm going to hand back to you, and if you'd like to pose your own question um, it, that you've posted up in the chat. Are you there, Ivy? Yes, I am. That's super. Ivy. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so these are really, really fascinating um, data, and I'm really curious about what is going to be the long-term impact? And I think, Andy, you were alluding to that, right? There's this blip. This blip will be moving through the system, or is it going to cause you know, sub substantial um, changes? So um, you guys have presented some very, very interesting longitudinal data so that there were some trends that you would see um, in the various data sets. And these trends have been interrupted by COVID. Um, is it just sort of an interruption and the trends are going to continue in the same direction? Uh, will there be sort of a subsequent move in a different direction? So um, curious about what are uh, the short and long-term impacts that you're that you're seeing for COVID um, in the in the data sets. Um, so maybe I'll 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 first get uh, get Andy. I think there's lots of opportunities. I also think there's going to be an awful lot of people wanting to go back to the old ways because they felt comfortable. Um, there could be uh, from ranging from telehealth. Uh, oh, I don't like that. I think we ought to go back. You know, there could be some pushback from that. There could also be with respect to exams. I want to have the exams well, because I feel com more comfortable that you pass this exam and because you've passed that exam, you now can be first on call in paediatrics. It's like, really, did that exam, is it be all and end all? Does it really need to? Um, but exams are an income stream for some people. So you have that sort of conflict of interest. I know this is recorded. I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying that. Um, so I, th I think there is, um, but, but I think the best, the interesting thing is many things that people thought about, actually we did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, um, almost to the extent, um, the, um, across all the regulating boards of health professions, they had to put out a, a letter of support, that's probably the wrong phrase, to all clinicians saying, we understand the high pressure you're working on, you're having to make decisions on the spot, doing stuff. And you might make that decision before COVID, you could have been struck off, but now we'll be sympathetic. You're under high pressure. It wasn't a mistake. It's just the environment you're in and don't stop, don't feel you need to stop doing the work. But I, I think there's, going back to the original question, I think there will be pushback to go back to the new normal, but I don't think we'll ever have the old. Yeah, no, absolutely, I suspect. Um, others, are there any, so we have a, a, a very large concern around the, uh, sustainability of the workforce here. I posted just some data that we have. So public opinion data, nine out of 10 Canadians are very concerned about the mental health 
of health workers, eight out of 10 concerned about their own ability to access access was very much an issue in the Australia, New Zealand um, conversation that we had um, earlier. And, uh, and also concerns about quality of care uh, in regards to the shortage and it's in the media quite a lot, um, uh, these concerns. I mean, it, it's in the media, it hasn't moved our governments very much um, as of yet, but uh, one, one would hope. So I'm curious about, about that as well. I, I think what one way of looking at it is the impact or potential impact at different levels within the service. For example, practices have now got the technology to support remote working in a way they didn't have before. So, so they can carry that forward. Um, practitioners have also learned how to use that technology. So, so they again can adapt. They have learned in some ways how to do remote consultations in a different way because there are lots and lots of things in the background um, that you just take for granted if you're seeing someone face to face and you can't make those judgments or assessments if, if the, the patient is not there. Um, so th they've learned to do that. But I think what I'm seeing a lot of is, is what you refer to the stress of, of making those decisions, perhaps feeling like you're managing risks at a much higher level uh, than you were used to before. Um, and even though there have been these messages that Andy's spoken about of support, people are feeling that that won't last forever. And, and where does it stop? I think the other level is looking at patients, how acceptable do they find remote consultations? How long can they kind of be satisfied with something that isn't what they had before that they felt was a holistic consultation where they felt understood, acknowledged, examined in, in person? L lots and lots of different things. And, and, and also there's the question of health inequalities because there are that there is a quite a, a proportion of people who are not able or are not uh, comfortable with accessing health. There's, there's a few who find it easier and some transactional consultations can work really well uh, on the remote basis, but there are many who, who feel that they, they need to be in the room um, to actually have a satisfactory consultation. So I, I think it's, it's, it's all up for grabs at the moment. There are many things that we have discovered, new opportunities, accelerated developments that were already happening in a lot of places. Um, but there are also others who, who find that it's just not a comfortable place to be. And, and some of those practitioners are actually leaving because, it, because of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sharon. Other um, thoughts, uh, Morag, Ben, or? John about sort of the legacy of COVID for the different kind of data sets that you're that you're collecting from. I think it's been quite hard for us to see in our uh, sort of main workforce data uh, the impact of COVID in full. Um, so when looking at the sort of employment data that we have in Scotland, we can see that there's been a big increase in fixed term contracts. So they will inevitably come to an end, whether they become permanent contracts, we don't know. Um, but, but, you know, what will happen once once they do finish? Does that leave a, a gap? Um, we also uh, have had a couple of data collections that have been really disturbed over the pandemic just due to data providers not being able to provide that information, such as our vacancies. Um, but, but it looks like they are increasing um, as well. And um, I think that and it's it's there will be this big lag um, and this distortion of uh, understanding those dynamics until we have that that evidence in, in these data um, from our perspective from work we don't really have access to more qualitative data um, you know so it's kind of hard to comment from from that that perspective um, and and again with the GP workforce data we um, we, can, we can't really see much in that right now because um, of the time that the snapshots of these, the census that these data were taken. Um, so the impact of, uh, of COVID on, on that workforce, yeah, we, we, don't, we don't fully know, I don't think. Um, ben, is there anything I've missed? Yeah, in just one thing which has always struck me is the bomb. Um, it's quite difficult I, I find it quite difficult to disentangle the impact of brexit which happened just before covid hit 
on the workforce compared to what COVID is doing is it's quite difficult to sort of disentangle at the moment we're seeing um, falling numbers of den dentists for example is one of the things which strikes me in the data there's falling numbers of dentists some of that is due to um because of covid no dentist graduated from university um qualified as a dentist um in scotland i'm not sure about england but in scotland no it was just a scotland thing just a scotland thing yes there was no new sort of entries because they didn't get the sufficient um um aspirating um experience to be able to qualify so is that is that the reason or is there was a because there was a big increase um about 10 15 years ago in number of dentists and it's yeah from the from europe so it's i would say that's a an issue we've got in understanding the impact of covid Absolutely. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Ben. So lots of different um, things to, to tease apart. And I, um, I know that there's some sharing of information um, in the in the chat. Um, so just um, maybe want to uh, uh, give a thanks to everybody who presented. We're just about um, three minutes uh, to. Um, so just wanted to give sort of the panelists uh, in the order that they uh, presented. So Sharon and John. Uh, ben and Morag, Andy, any final parting comments um, before we close off? Uh, not a lot to add apart from what I just said about the uncertainty of, of these impacts. Um, but I, I think it's going to be a journey of discovery as we move forward to see what, what works, what works where, what works for whom, all, all these sorts of things we will need to keep looking at. Absolutely. John? Uh, yeah, I should just also add that we, we've asked some questions within our survey about COVID specific uh, issues. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to share those today, but that will be forthcoming and we can share links when that becomes publicly available. That's super. Thanks so much. Ben? Nothing for me to add. Okay. And Morag? Yep, similar. Thank, thanks for everyone for the, their presentations. I really enjoyed listening to them. That's wonderful. And thanks so much, Chris, for um, moderating. And uh, we will have our next session um, at 11 today. Uh, well, 11 here, uh, where I am. Um, I, I do want to give a shout out to um, Gail. She wins the award for getting up the earliest. So she's in different time zones. So she's an hour earlier than us. So thanks so much to Gail uh, for that. And uh, so do continue to um, have our conversations. This is the whole reason behind the IHWC is for us to learn from each other. And um, so very much want to, uh, to thank you uh, for that. So uh, we'll close off and uh, invite you to, uh, to the next session. If anybody would like to stay after uh, we stop the recording, please, you're welcome to, to do so if you want to have a shorter conversation, we can keep the, the the Zoom link open. All right, thanks everybody, have a great day.